Hey everyone, welcome to episode 55, which is the beginning of a new series that will explore the diversity of land plants, of the, the Kingdom Plantea. The Kingdom Plantea, or the Verita Plantea, includes 350,000 known species. This series will follow the evolution of the lineage of land plants and the emergence of all of these hundreds of thousands of species, and each episode will cover a major evolutionary lineage or a branch of the kingdom. Because I like to follow the chronological order of evolutionary events, I'll begin the series by talking about the ancestors of all plants, and their most recently emerged descendants. With that said, today I'll be starting with the oldest plants, with the aquatic and semi-aquatic green algae that would give rise to the land plants some 540 million years ago. However, the story of green algae begins long before this. Around 1.5 billion years ago, life was pretty much entirely single-celled organisms. The next big milestone in the evolution of life after the emergence of life in the first place was the emergence of photosynthesis. Larger cells engulfed smaller photosynthetic cells, but instead of digesting them, incorporated them into their bodies, into their metabolism and their cellular functions. This endosymbiosis is a huge milestone, because it led to the emergence of eukaryotic cells with organelles and a nucleus. These young eukaryotes would diverge into three major clades, the red algae, the glycophytic algae, and the green algae. The red algae are eukaryotic cells, and even though they use photosynthesis with chloroplast pigments, they have their reddish color because they also express accessory pigments called phycobiliproteins, which help them absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. Now the glycophytic algae are freshwater algae with a few green chloroplasts inside their membrane. Both the red algae and the glycophytic algae possess phycobiliproteins, and they store the carbon from photosynthesis directly in their cytosol. In red algae, the chloroplasts are arranged in thylakoids, and these thylakoids are just scattered in a mess throughout the cell. Additionally, the individual cells of red algae and glycophytic algae don't have flagella. They move through the water with other mechanisms, like cilia, or they simply just resign themselves to being moved around by the currents of the water. Now, green algae are different. Most obviously, they're green because they don't have any of these phycobili proteins, so their photosynthesis and their green color comes entirely from the pigments in the chloroplasts. These pigments are chlorophyll A and B, which are optimized for absorbing wavelengths of blue and red light. These pigments were passed down to all the land plant descendants of the green algae, which is what gives the leaves of ferns, trees, and cactuses their green color. It's why all of the land plants around us are green. Also like land plants, green algae organize their thylakoids in neat columns, or stacks. They don't have them scattered all throughout their cell in a random pile like red algae does. Plants also store sugar in the form of starch. They have chemically similar sperm and chemically similar cell walls with green algae. All of these similarities are lines of evidence placing the green algae as the ancestors of all plants, because they have they were the first group to have all of these qualities, or a lot of these qualities, and their plant descendants kind of mutated these qualities and added onto them and diverged and radiated into all of these different kinds of plants. But back to green algae, unlike red algae and glycophytic algae, the cells of these ancestral green algae species, they did have flagella and this allowed their cells to propel themselves in a coordinated, directed movement and uh, navigate themselves through the water. So this kind of gave them a leg up on fertilizing in liquid environments. When the green algae emerged as some of the earliest eukaryotes on Earth, they soon began to experience internal division as the ancestral population group spread out and diverged. Two major clades appeared, the chlorophytes and the caraphytes. Both clades are really diverse, with a huge range of physiologies and morphologies. The chlorophytes, for example, include unicellular and multicellular algae species. Some are parasitic, others are free-living organisms. Some species live in freshwater, others live in saltwater, while others still live on dry land, from tropical jungles to hot deserts to the wintry boreal forests. Some species of chlorophyte algae live in a symbiosis with other organisms, like some species of lichen. Lichen are pretty interesting. The majority of lichens are phycobionts, with the minority having cyanobacteria instead of green algae. 
The numerous species of phycobiont lichen are composed of chlorophyte algae growing symbiotically with the hyphaea of some species of fungus. The chlorophyte genus Trabuxia commonly grows in symbiosis with a fungus to produce a large circular growth. Uh, it, it's bright yellow in the center and it fades to orange near its sides, and it grows typically on the bark of a tree trunk. Another chlorophyte genus is called Trentipolia, and it also grows out of the bark of trees, uh, mostly on tropical and subtropical trees, except the species in this genus, instead of looking like yellow circles, they look like fuzzy orange blobs and fuzzy patches that grow in scattered clumps along the tree's tissue. Lichens are interesting because they're really simple organic structures, but they serve important functions. Physiologically, they don't offer a whole lot. Lichen doesn't have roots. They don't penetrate deeply into the soil or into a plant host. They don't even need to be supplied by a constant stream of water. They're lightweight, fibrous, and they can survive desiccation. They're really just like thin sheets or fibers or bulges of symbiotic cells that grow in tiny patches wherever they can. And they can grow almost anywhere. Lichen prefer to grow on trees, as the trees raise them up off the ground and expose them to airflow and sunlight, which helps them grow. But lichens can also grow on the ground, in bare soil, and even on or in solid rock, where the cellular level growth of the lichen creeps into the cracks and pores and crevices between the grains and the rock. However, because lichen are so simple, they lack a lot of the more chemically sophisticated defenses common in the green plants. For example, they don't have leaves, or diverse storage organs, nor do they have any stomata, or even a cuticle. As such, the lichens are dangerously exposed to their environment, unable to regulate water loss, or prevent absorption of dangerous chemicals. Because of their high surface area and the lack of a cuticle, the lichen will readily absorb any airborne substance or contaminants, and they'll also readily transpire a lot of their water content. Because of this particularly novel feature of lichen, they've been used as biomonitors to detect levels of airborne pollution and better understand the atmospheric quality of the forests and the woodlands that they live in. Like I said, the chlorophyta include a wide diversity of species, with an equally wide diversity of morphologies, lifestyle strategies, and reproductive mechanisms. Some of these species include the primitive paraphyletic Prasinophysaea, which are single-celled species of algal plankton. Some of these species have cells with just one flagella, or none at all, while other species have up to eight flagella that they pulse and wave to swim through the water. All of the Prasinophysaea have a single chloroplast and a single mitochondria to sustain themselves. Another primitive group of chlorophytes are called the Palmophyllales, which are unicellular organisms that grow in colonies, or masses, of pseudo-multicellular organisms. These are pseudo-multicellular because they excrete a gelatinous slime, and so this makes a giant mass of just slime, and the cells swim within it, and so they're kind of technically connected through a connective tissue. That slime is like other connective tissue that's composed of an extracellular matrix with cells floating within it somewhere. This is kind of like bone tissue and osteocytes, or cartilage and chondrocytes, or like blood and erythrocytes. There's also the Pedonomonataceae family, which is composed of unicellular species characterized by cells that each possess just a single flagella. There's an order of chlorophytes called the chlorodendralis, which are unicellular, flagellated algae that possess literal scales. They have scales made of carbohydrates that overlap and meld together over the outer surface of the cell body to create a fused outer wall. Each chlorodendralis cell has four flagella, and these are all covered in uh, unfused scales that allow for articulation and movement. Many of these green algae exist in the oceans, and a lot of them, uh, like the chlorodendrales, are considered to be a kind of plankton. Two groups of chlorophytes are of particular note, the chlorophysaea and the ulvophysaea. Both of these groups are really diverse in their own right, and include a range of species with wildly different morphologies. For example, the chlorophysaea have chemical similarities to plants in, in a lot of ways, including their cellulose cell walls and their phytochromes and flavonoids and their chloroplasts. But the shape and structure of the chloroplasts has great variety, 
They can be shaped like discs or like cups. They can be stretched out like a long ribbon or a, a spiral shape like a screw, all depending on the Chlorophysaean species that we're looking at. Now, the Ulvophysaea species also have a lot of morphological diversity. These are mostly species of seaweed, like the genus Codium. These green algae have two forms, one which grows as a fuzzy layer of soft algal tissue, and the other which grows long, thin, soft branches. There's also the genus Monostroma, which includes species that look like green tissue paper, or sheets of a thin green fabric. They're literally composed of sheets of single-cell layers, creating a very thin but wide organic sheet. These monostroma algae are popular in sushi, where they're used as the outer roll of seaweed that holds the rice and the fish together. Then there's the genus Calerpa, which also includes species of leafy seaweed. The crazy thing is that Calerpa organisms are large, but they're composed of just a single cell. The cell is packed with nuclei, it's multinucleated, and this helps to support its size by providing the necessary enzymes and proteins for growth at every region within its single cellular body. They can grow to world record size for individual cells, with some specimens growing more than three feet long. That's a single cell that's three feet from end to end. It's huge. There's another genus of green algae chlorophytic ulvophysaeans, which are called the acetabularia. These are similar to the calerpa in that each individual is just a single cell, but the individuals can grow to be macroscopic in size, which means they're some of the largest cells in the world. These acetabularia algae have a single nucleus at their base. From the nucleus, small little rhizoid pseudo-roots will poke out and down to establish an anchor for the algae to grow. Then a stalk extends upwards, up to about 10 centimeters in height, where it ends in a broad circular cap that looks like a perfectly circular leaf. The Calerpa species have large cells, and they require a lot of nuclei, but the large acetabularia cells only have one nuclei. Well, they have one nuclei structure, but it's actually composed of a lot of individual nuclei that are all smashed together inside the same nuclear membrane. To reproduce, some of these individual nuclei will undergo meiosis to produce gametes, and these gametes are then released into the water where they fertilize the gametes of another individual. These are most of the major groups within the chlorophytes, which if you remember are one of two major lineages of the green algae. The other lineage are the caraphytes, the caraphyta. From within this lineage uh, emerged the embryophyta, or the land plants. So all of the rest of the land plants, the trees, the flowers, the cactus, everything you see that's not algae or a fungus, but that is a plant, they all came from these caraphytes. They all descended from this caraphyta. I want to focus briefly on the caraphyta, because these are all the groups and lineages within the clade streptophyta that doesn't necessarily include the land plants themselves. The caraphytes have more genetic and chemical similarities with the land plants than the chlorophytes do, indicating the arrangement of these close genetic relationships. Some of the earliest caraphytes diverged into the mesostigmata physaea, which are scaled, kind of like the chlorodendralis, and there was also the divergence of the chlorochybophysaea, which is a kind of algae found in the soil of high-altitude alpine biomes. The next divergence in the caraphyte lineage produced the clebsormidiaceae, this is a relatively small family of green algae with individual cells that look like plump little cylinders. The cells divide along their long axis, and this creates a single-celled column that forms long strands or filaments of cells. They grow in huge numbers to create slimy, fibrous mats made up of millions of these tangled green filaments. They can also reproduce through fragmentation, which is a, a crude process by which literal fragments or chunks of cells broken off of an adult can actually stay alive and generate a new individual. When the Klebsormidiaceae diverged from the main green algae lineage, the species they left behind remained in a group called Phragmoplastophyta. This clade of caraphytic green algae is split into four smaller lineages, one of which would become the land plants, but I'll get to them at the end of the episode. The first of these lineages to branch out of the Phragmoplastophyta were the Caraphysaea. This lineage has remarkable similarities to land plants, and you can see a lot of shared features between them, like upright growth with regular nodes, and little branches coming off of the nodes. In many of these species, like the stoneworts, 
They grow on the shallow floor of an ocean, like near an island or a shoreline where they can be held upright and swayed around by the water currents and still have access to the sunlight. Their thin stalk is actually composed of a single cell. Uh, the cell is just a huge, extremely elongated, multinucleated column, you know, and this compensates for its huge size. Shortly after the Caryophysaea diverged from the Phragmoplastophyta clade, another divergence emerged from the main line and produced the Coleocatophysaea. These live in a manner very similar to land-based epiphytes. They use the bodies of other plants as a mechanical substrate to grow upon, but they don't parasitize or extract resources from their host. Instead, they absorb nutrients from the proximal water. Like the rest of the green algae, the Coleocatophysaea express an alternation of generations as they reproduce and perpetuate their lineages. They have a stage where they release gametes that fuse and form zygotes, and they have a stage where they release spores that go out on their own and form new individuals. The coleocatophytes can reproduce asexually by budding off a few cells, and these swim through the water to find a good growing place somewhere else, and then they'll land, they'll divide by mitosis, and they'll form new mature adults. They can also reproduce sexually by releasing haploid sperm into the water, and the sperm will swim to another adult algae where it's holding an egg and fertilization will occur. This is kind of interesting, because the fertilization creates a diploid zygote that stays retained in the mature algae's body. It'll grow into a larger mass, and the parent algae will surround it with sterile cells that will encapsulate it and protect it. Sometimes these sterile cells will be used like a transfer area for the parent algae to hand off nutrients to the zygote, but they're mostly just used for mechanical separation. Instead of forming a single individual, the zygote will undergo meiosis and produce 8 to 32 smaller individual cells called zoospores. These then swim off as independent cells to create new individuals. After the Coleocatophysaea diverged, another lineage rapidly diverged from the main line, called the Zygnomatophysaea. This class is further divided into two lineages, called the Zygnomatales and the Desmidiales. The Zygnomatale species have longer rod or tube-like cells, like those in the genus Spirogyra, which are columnar cells with their chloroplasts arranged in a tight spiral formation. These tube-shaped cells grow in long, unbranching filaments, which appear to us, from our macroscopic perspective, as clumps or sheets of just fuzzy green slime. The Zygnomatales reproduce sexually through a relatively unique mechanism called conjugation. The individual filaments of Zygnomatales algae can be gendered, either male or female. And to reproduce, an individual male and female filament will line up parallel to one another. They extend a short plasma membrane bridge, or a corridor, which the male cell squirms through like an amoeba. The male cell meeting with the female cell then allows fusion and the formation of a zygote, which undergoes meiosis to produce more filaments. The desmidiales, or the desmids, also occasionally reproduce through this process of conjugation. But this only tends to happen under stressful conditions, when the desmid species needs to ensure genetic variety is perpetuated into the incoming generations. I mean, this is a good strategy in a stressful condition, where individuals might die frequently, and populations may shrink considerably. When conditions like this are stressful, you want to encourage sexual reproduction so that you encourage the, uh, the generation of new alleles. And when you do this, when you generate new alleles and you kind of preserve and increase your own genetic diversity, you increase the chances that one of these individuals, one or more of these individuals, will have some kind of genetic resistance to a disease or some kind of genetic adaptation or tolerance somehow to the stressful environmental conditions. And if this genetic trait appears, it can be preserved. Under normal conditions, you know, not stressful conditions, the desmids will just reproduce asexually through cellular fission. The desmids algae are particularly fascinating because they exist as single-celled organisms, but each cell looks like two symmetrical segments, only connected to each other by a very narrow extension of membrane that houses the nucleus. So the nucleus is like the knot that ties the two symmetrical halves together. The cells exhibit a wall structure kind of similar to plant cells. I mean, there's an inner cell wall composed of cellulose, just like in plants, and an outer cell wall. But instead of lignin, this outer cell wall has just more cellulose. The key difference is that it also has compounds ingrained within it 
that make it thicker and stronger, with mechanical protrusions like warts and spines. On top of this, the cell walls have pores that allow the secretion of a slippery mucus that coats the cell and protects it. And this is a, a mechanism that's really similar to land plants that excrete cuticle, which helps them seal in moisture. It should then be no surprise that these Zygnomatophysaea are believed to be the closest relatives to the fourth and the final lineage that diverge from the Phragmoplastophyta. This lineage is Embryophyta, the land plants, which will be the focus of all the rest of the episodes in this series. I'm a little conflicted on this episode. It's definitely not as long as my usual episodes, but algae are just so wildly diverse that there's no way I could really hope to comprehensively cover all of their morphologies and reproductive mechanisms in a single episode. It would be a huge, jumbled, disorganized mess of an episode, and it would be really confusing to listen to. I mean, more confusing than it already is to listen to me rattle off all these uh, scientific names from the big book of algal taxonomy. For what it's worth, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you learned something cool about green algae. Join me next episode as I explore the first few species of land plants to emerge onto dry land. And as always, thanks for listening. to support the biologic podcast it's super easy when you open a new episode press the like button or share it with your friends if you aren't subscribed you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week you can also peruse our official store which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts hoodies and stickers all the links you need are in the description section below 